Hi everyone and welcome back to our Arm Tech Talk series. This is the place for the latest and greatest trends, technologies and best practices from Arm and our ecosystem partners. It's great you can join us wherever you're joining us from in the world. I'm your host Tobias McBride and together with you, our audience, I'm super excited for today's Arm Tech Talk, which we're going to get to in just a minute. Before we do that, you may have seen that uh, a couple of weeks ago now, it feels like it was just yesterday, we were at CES and we were talking about the amazing new announcements, products, features and demos shown at that uh, incredible showcase of ARM technology. If you've missed any of those, just head to youtube.com slash ARM. There's a dedicated CES playlist and there's even a dedicated Tech Talk playlist as well. You know, we don't just do CES, we don't just do these Tech Talks uh, today, we do them every week. So if you've missed any of our tech talks and you're interested in finding the latest and greatest from ARM partners, just head to this link. There's a dedicated playlist for you to check those out. And if you're interested in any of our upcoming ARM tech talks, if you want to get the latest from the ARM ecosystem, just head to arm.com slash tech talks to do so. Um, so as I said, we were at CES. It was really great to see all the great innovation. Uh, but that's not why you're here today. Today, you're here to talk about the amazing work of uh, Advanced Solution Netherlands, uh, who have been doing and going to be talking about today, developing FDA compliant smartwatch algorithms, IOMT smartwatch algorithms uh, on Cortex-M. Uh, so with that, it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Sanjeev Sarpal, who's founder and director of uh, ASN to the stage. Sanjeev, thank you so much for joining today. Thank you. Well, that's great. Thanks for that great introduction. So let's uh, No worries. And I understand... Yeah, while well, you're getting your share screen live, um, yeah. I understand you're joining us from the Netherlands, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. So we're one hour forward from the UK. Um, so. Exactly. Well, thank you so much for joining us. We're super excited. And just while you're getting that share screen live, if you've got any questions, audience, as it comes through, uh, as this present, this great presentation from uh, Sanjeev today comes through, uh, who's also an ARM ambassador, actually, and we're going to talk about that later. Uh, so I'm super excited to have him for that reason as well. Any questions uh, on the events page you're on, just use the uh, link on the right-hand side of your page. There's a little Slido link, uh, and it says enter your Q&A there, and you can get those questions in, and we'll get them at the end. All right, that's enough from me, Sanjeev. Let's get your screen live. Uh, and with that, uh, I will be quiet, and it's over to you to talk about the amazing work you've been doing. Thanks. OK, well, Welcome, everybody. And in order to tell you a little bit more about myself, I'm the founder and director of ASN. I currently lead our AIoT solutions team. I have a background in hardware design, but I also have a PhD in signal processing uh, and specialize in edge algorithmic solutions on ARM processors. Over the years, uh, we've developed over 26 commercial products for various international clients and work very, very closely with ARM, TI, analog devices, Bosch and ST. I'm also a passionate cook of Mediterranean food, uh, enjoying a glass of Merlot with the delights of the region. So let's kick this off. Let's look at some fundamentals of ECG. What is ECG? Electrocardiogram. It's a waveform that describes the events in a cardiac cycle. So as you can see here on the right, we have our biomedical features that are designated by these letters P, Q, R, S, and T. So these define points in time, uh, features that we want to pull out. So the ECG waveform is feature rich, but it's also extremely fragile. And fragile in the sense that it is susceptible to motion artifacts, power line interference, and measurement noise from the instrumentation. So it, it's a very challenging aspect in order to pull out these biometric features uh, correctly. So that's what uh, people all around the world basically work on with their algorithms in order to automatically find these features for their IOMT telemedicine type applications. So let's look at uh, typical applications here. So many of you probably have a smartwatch and these are using dry electrodes in the sense that you're wearing the smartwatch on your wrist and you use the finger from your other hand in order to complete the circuits and you'll get an ECG waveform. It's very, very clever. 
Now, there are also these things called the health patches. So if you look at the picture on the right, these are using wet electrodes. So the advantage is that they're attached to the skin, so they have better contact, and as such, they are less susceptible to motion artifacts. Also, the advantage of a health patch is that you can simultaneously uh, track ECG and PPG. But as you can see, it's, it's not very aesthetically pleasing. The smartwatch is much more aesthetically pleasing. Now, for those of you uh, doing FDA type certification, uh, um, I'm sure you've come across the IEC requirements. So IEC 6601 parts 25, 27 and 47 are relevant to designing ECG type products. So I would say that they're broken up into two main categories. You have the diagnostic, so you're going to make medical grade type equipment. So if you think about um, doing stuff for a hospital or anything uh, that requires medical grade analysis, you need to go for part 25, which is a much wider bandwidth. You can see from 50 millihertz all the way up to 150 hertz. But for a majority of this presentation, I'm going to focus on this thing called ambulatory or the wearables market, as that's where smartwatches and other types of uh, wearable devices fit into. So it is a case of um, most of you have, who have done the FDA certification have also done the uh, pre-compliance, which is basically a quick check to say, is it safe to use? Is it effective to use? So you're not going to... Uh, basically electrocute somebody or hurt them in any way. It's a very simple check. So let's have a look at the criteria. As I said, we'll, we'll focus on part 47, uh, which is for the wearable market. So the signal bandwidth um, that we're interested in is 670 millihertz all the way up to 40 hertz. So the requirement actually specifies that you use a 5 hertz sine wave and you calibrate uh, your signal chain uh, and ensure that the amplitude error is between plus and minus 3 dB. If you're going for the diagnostic market, then you need to basically ensure that it's between plus and minus 1 dB. So it's actually quite tricky if you go into the diagnostic market. And there are a few more technical details based upon the test waveforms you use, such as overshoot. So I think one of the most challenging aspects that we've seen over the years has been to ensure that you correct the effects of the Sigma Delta ADC that is inside the biomedical sock. So they basically, um, with a Sigma Delta ADC, um, it will lead to amplitude droop and that must be corrected in order to satisfy the criteria of the IEC requirements. For those of you doing multi-channel, uh, temporal, um, multi-channel ECG applications, you need to also ensure that the temporal alignment is within plus or minus 20 milliseconds. And I think one of the most challenging aspects is basically cleaning up the ECG. So if you look at the picture on the right, you can see, okay, our requirement is to remove the noise and the artifacts that we don't want. But as you can see, if you have a very narrow band, low pass filter, it will basically reduce the amplitude and increase the width of our R wave. So I'll go into this in a little bit more detail now, because you're probably thinking, mm, what does he mean there? So if we use a traditional narrow band, low pass filter, we obtain the result on the left-hand side. So the idea, as I said, is just to remove the noise and clean the ECG up. But then as you can see, we've reduced the amplitude of the peak and the width of our R wave is broader. So what we actually need is some kind of adaptive uh, low pass filter. And we've actually developed an algorithm uh, that facilitates that whereby we'll adjust the bandwidth of our low pass filter depending upon which time region um, the waveform is in. So you can see on the right, we've maintained the width of our R peak, which is perfect for QRS 
uh, duration measurements and also not done a bad job with uh, the amplitude. So how do you build a IEC compliant filter chain? So you start off with a high pass filter. So as we said for wearables, the lower region is 670 millihertz. So the point of the high pass filter is to remo remove any baseline wonder. Then it goes through a low pass filter, uh, 40 hertz, which also removes any effects of power line interference. And then depending upon the implementation of the biomedical uh, IC that you're using, you may need one of these CIC correction filters, which corrects the droop of the ADC filter. And then the final block is this adaptive type low pass filter, such that it maintains the correct shape and width of your biomedical data. So at the bottom, you can see the orange signal is actually, it was actually live data and the green signal is the result of the filtering operation. I would say as well, please ensure that you use FIR type filters with the linear phase characteristic as this preserves the temporal relationships of the biomedical data. So what are the challenges uh, when we're working with ECG data? What are the algorithmic challenges more specifically? So for those of you that have basically been working on this for a while at universities, research institutes, perhaps even at businesses, most of these things, most of these algorithms have been pretty much designed for MATLAB or Python or things like that. They're not really designed for real time. So there is a, a more advanced technique, wavelet analysis, that has absolutely excellent performance, but is computationally expensive. So if you're going to go for something that has very, very high performance, such as wavelet analysis, you need a more powerful um, processor, such as a Cortex-M7. And the disadvantage would be that you get a worse battery life. So there is a trade-off there. My advice would be to use some kind of FIR filtering chain, as shown on the previous sheet. Uh, even though this may have large latency uh, and uh, I would say moderate computational cost, it's the best of both worlds. There are some of you that are probably thinking, ah, Sanjeev, I don't believe it, I use IAR filters. I would say please stay away from IAR type filters as it has nonlinear phase and it warps the characteristics of our biomedical data, as I'll demonstrate in a minute. You can use these things called zero phase filtering, but then that's not suitable for streaming applications. So it's all for offline analysis. If you want to do offline analysis, then yes, you can use that. But if you're looking for streaming real time, then I would advocate the FIR route. Perhaps one of the biggest challenges um, that's faced by many developers is this overlapping of frequencies. So your noise or the artifacts that you want to get rid of overlap your delicate ECG data, which is why techniques such as wavelets analysis is so popular. So let's have a look more specifically at one or two problems that many, many people encounter here. So as I mentioned, baseline wonder is something that is the first block in our processing chain. Now, what you can do is you can also use splines. Now, for those of you that are unaware of what a spline is, um, you can see that purple line here that is basically fitted to our input data and then it is subtracted. The advantage is it has zero latency, but the biggest challenge of splines are that you have to find these correction points that we call knots. And if you can't find those correction points, you can't fit that spline uh, to that data. So it has its limitations, but when it does work, it works very, very well. So as I mentioned, please stay away from IAR filters, even though they have low computational cost. You can see with the animation here, whereby we're modifying the uh, cutoff frequency of a high pass 
filter, how it warps our QRS uh, region. So if you just wait a second, it will start again. You can see with the dash lines, you can see how when the cutoff frequency is increased, it warps everything. So it's not really suitable for clinical analysis. So that's why I'm saying please stay away from IAR filters. So I would say the best compromise is the FIR filter as it has linear phase and it preserves the temporal relationships of our signal. So it preserves the shape of our signal. So it's the best compromise. It can have very, very high uh, number of coefficients. That's one of the biggest disadvantages. So if you have a high sampling rate and a very low cutoff frequency, um, you know, the number of coefficients could go above a thousand, but there are tricks um, in order to reduce the number of coefficients. But as I said, it's the best compromise of all methods. So power line interference is also something um, that comes about a lot. So you have the high impedance probes, uh, certainly with the health patch, that can basically swamp the data. But for those of you that have been uh, paying more attention, uh, I would say uh, you're probably thinking, okay, then you have a 40 hertz bandwidth so you don't have any problems for 50 or 60 hertz power line interference but the real challenge comes about if you're going to do medical grade devices with this 150 hertz bandwidth so more thought is required there i would say that over the last few years there have been these things called ai kernel filters so you're using machine learning to design some black box magic filter in order to remove your motion artifacts. Problem with that is you need a massive amount of training data that is relevant to your use case. So that's not always easy. But ARM offer their new AI processors such as the M52 um, in order to help you there. So let's have a look at PPG. So as you can see by the waveform there, it's, it looks fundamentally different to the ECG waveform. So PPG is an optical method um, that's basically designed to measure arterial blood volume. So on smartwatches, health patches, and that kind of stuff, it is basically using LEDs and photodiodes in order to determine that. So it is a case of the sensor is usually attached to a wrist or finger or even earlobe. And unfortunately, the performance is dependent upon skin color and the LED wavelengths that are used. Most applications use an EC, um, a PPG, excuse me, uh, for, at about 50 hertz in order to pull out the features of interest. High performance applications such as feature extraction. So if you want to pull out the dichrotic notch and that kind of stuff, you need to go to a much higher sampling rate uh, around 500 Hertz. So for those of you with experience, I'm sure you're no stranger to the effects of motion artifacts. It is incredibly sensitive to motion artifacts. There is an IEC uh, specification that is available for those of you designing pulse oximeter 8601. Um, so I'd say please go away and um, you know study that if you're doing a pulse oximeter type application. So let's have a look at motion artifacts and PPG as this is something that we see a lot at ASN uh, where people contact us and say, do you have a good solution? Um, the problem is that our pulse rate or PR uh, the region of interest is between half a hertz and five hertz if you're just looking at the heart rate. The motion artifacts overlap that, and the motion artifacts can be massive. So you can see with the picture on the right, um, even though you have your PPG data, you have the effects of motion artifacts that can, in some cases, completely destroy um, your PPG data. So sensor placement is absolutely essential. So a PPG type uh, application on your wrist for a smartwatch in particular is very tricky, um, simply because people move their wrists. 
Um, and I'll demonstrate that shortly. I have a short um, video to show that. So the best positions, even though they may not be the handiest, are either on the fingertip or the earlobe. So if you think about how even when you're walking, your earlobe, for instance, stays more or less stable. It doesn't really move. So this is why people, uh, when they're really looking for robust solutions, they use earlobe. So over the years, um, researchers have come up with various techniques in order to minimize the effects of motion artifacts. Single value decomposition, independent component analysis, time frequency analysis, adaptive filters, multicolored LEDs, all kinds of magic uh, in order to basically try and correct the motion artifacts. In many cases, they'll use accelerometer data in order to correct the PPG. But accelerometer data has its limitations, as I want to demonstrate in this next slide. So I've got a little video here. So this is an experiment um, that I conducted whereby I'm wearing a smartwatch. And the idea is that I'm going to move my fingers very gently. And then we have our triaxial data. And I've superimposed the PPG data. So if I play that, you can see that when my hand is still, it looks great. But even the slightest movement causes the PPG data to jump around, even though the accelerometer doesn't register it. It's only when um, I start to move my wrist, uh, which you'll see now, that the accelerometer will actually show uh, movement. So accelerometers have their limitations, and I would say they have their limitations in the sense that you need to get the placement just right. But if you're doing a smartwatch type application, that's the best you can do. Whoops. So what can we basically do to improve that? So what we've been working on uh, with some of our uh, partners have been just using things like signal quality index. So we take the accelerometer data, we take the PPG data, we filter it, and we put it through an analysis method. So we can basically look at the statistical uh, characteristics of the data and then come up with a signal quality index between 1 and 100%, uh, 0 and 100%, excuse me, and say, OK, this is a good time to measure. Uh, this is a bad time to measure. This is a moderate time to measure. Um, and then that is something whereby I think um, for certainly real-time wearable applications, that has proved to be the most effective. Now, if you're using a health patch, as I said, a health patch is something that can measure PPG and ECG simultaneously, you can do some clever tricks here. So even if you look at the ECG data here, even a moderate amount of baseline wonder, we can still determine these R peaks. It's, it's not that difficult. But if we look at the PPG data, it's incredibly difficult. So what we can do is we can basically use the ECG data in order to determine what our pulse rate is. And then we can design an adaptive comb filter tuned at that heart rate frequency in order to clean our PPG data. So there are some of you probably thinking, why would you bother then if you've got heart rate? But PPG has the advantage that you can do extra things such as working out SpO2, blood pressure, and that kind of thing. So these are little tricks that you can put in in order to enhance your solution, and they work in real time and don't particularly require much computational efforts. So how do we actually determine pulse rate then? So it's a no-brainer to say, yes, you need a bandpass filter. Uh, so we have our lower frequency and we have our upper frequency. So we want to basically say, OK, what is our pulse rate within 0.67 millihertz and uh, perhaps 5 hertz. So we can put that through our FIR filter, which has the advantage of preserving the temporal relationships. 
which is great. But then the problem is that you have to find some kind of detection threshold. How do you actually determine a detection threshold of a zero crossings detector? So if you look at the waveform shown here, the orange waveform is our PPG data. And right in the middle, we have some motion artifacts. Now, it's miles better to actually use a thing called a complex bandpass filter. So you actually look at phase. So what you can do is you can see this shark teeth uh, or sawtooth type waveform. And the ends are basically what you can use in order to determine the period. So you can basically differentiate this signal and you'll just get spikes. Um, so it's a very easy way of getting rid of the problem of what detection threshold do I need for my zero crossings detector. So for those of you who are thinking, oh my God, let's uh, look at this in a little more depth. Um, so this is the result of um, the result with a real filter. So this is our original data. So here's the zero. And then this is the result with a real bandpass filter for this particular data set. But you can see here, it doesn't transition uh, sometime. Um, so depending upon your data sets, um, you come up with performance that is not very, very good. Now, if I superimpose the result using this complex bandpass filter, you can see that it works every single time. Um, and we get these beautiful transitions. So that, that's just a, a little bit of food for thought for you there. So let's look at hardware. Um, most biomedical socks will have an internal RC oscillator, which will have a accuracy in the order of one or 2%. If you're looking for something much higher of much higher accuracy, then I would say please add an external crystal oscillator. And as mentioned before, many biomedical uh, socks implement this thing called a sigma delta ADC, which is very good for noise shaping, as it removes a lot of the noise at lower frequencies, but unfortunately introduces this amplitude drop. So. This is a typical example of a CIC response. You can see uh, this under here. So you can see it has this low pass effect. And what we need to do is design some kind of compensation filter such that we end up with a level line over our region of interest. So these are all things that you really need to take into account if you're going to do the compliance testing. Now, analytics, this is something that we've seen from many people that approach us, they just overlook it. They say, oh, well, we're just going to complete the average value, the mean. But what it is sensitive to is outliers. So occasionally you get a glitch and it throws the mean value off. It's miles better to actually use the median uh, to get rid of any outliers. And the best solution that we have seen and we use in our solutions has been to combine the median filter together with a moving average filter. So we use the median filter to exclude any outliers, and then we use the mean in order to get a very good average estimates. As mentioned uh, on a few slides ago, uh, signal quality index, um, you can use all of those kinds of statistical methods. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that. I would also say don't overlook derivatives. So looking at the shape of the waveform. So you can see here for our ECG type waveform, the yellow line is actually the derivative of that. So you can use information about uh, the peaks and troughs and their heights perhaps and their, their distances in order to get an idea of is this a real biomedical waveform. Now, as this is an ARM presentation, um, it's, it's uh, important to go through which ARM processor you'd need. So ARM offer an amazing variety, an amazing assortment of embedded devices for these types of applications. 
So for those of you who have a Fitbit, for example, uh, that's based upon the M3. So the M0 Plus and the M3 are very good for, I would say, simpler applications, especially pulse oximeter applications. Um, and I would say that uh, one of their biggest disadvantages, in my, my view, is that there is no hardware floating point support. So it prolongs developments of new algorithms. I would actually recommend uh, the M4F um, as that has hardware floating point support and is very, very good for rapid application development. If you need more power, um, then go to the M7. And if you need uh, security, hardware security, then the M33F as it implements ARM's trust zone. Um, ARM have, over the last year or two, have introduced a new family of a IoT processors or helium, um, and the newest addition to the family is the M52, uh, which is basically uh, a processor that is aimed at replacing the M33 as it combines ML, DSP, and security in one. Um, so, kind of next generation IoT processors and very, very suitable for biomedical applications. So let's have a look at some tools that ARM and ASN offer in order to help you along. Now, I basically um, come up with this thing called the SDS framework. So it's an easy way of capturing and playing back real-time sensor data. There are loads of uh, Python scripts for recording, playing back, visualizing, and data conversion. And I think one of the best things is this ability to generate a comma-separated data file, such that you can import uh, sensor data or measurement data from your hardware um, and import it into tools such as ASN's uh, Filter Designer, MATLAB, or even back into Python. Um, so. It, there are loads of tools available, and I would say, you know, please take the time and have a look and see see what you think. So if we look at um, the design workflow uh, for these types of applications, uh, so starting at the top left, you would have your application that you have developed. Uh, you would use the, the Python scripts in order to generate a comma-separated file you can load that comma-separated file into the ASN filter designer and visualize uh, the data in the signal analyzer. You can then design some type of filter or combination of filters for your application, optimize that, and then when you're ready, use the internal code generator in order to generate code for an ARM core. Alternatively, to support Python, MATLAB, c -sharp, um, it, it's quite extensive, and you know we'll, we'll demonstrate this uh, in the video in a, in a minute. So, what kits are available? Um, I would say analog devices offer the most coolest kits uh, for this kind of stuff. It's truly amazing what they have. So, they have this thing called the uh, VSM watch, which is basically in a smartwatch form factor, and it has all of the sensors is built into it uh, with a Bluetooth interface and an SDK. So you can pull out the data in real time and connect it up to your application and experiments. It's the same with the health sensor platform. Um, so those are you know, really, really cool factors. If you've got your own hardware and you just want to evaluate uh, the SOX, uh, I would say TI offer a really cool platform there. Uh, and also Austrian Microsystems. Uh, you can see with that uh, funny looking board with the fingers, uh, that's probably their um, humor there, um, in order to basically evaluate uh, your application. So there are a number of options that are available there. So I'd say I'd hand it over to, to Tobias to play the video whereby we can um, see the development of a PPG uh, pulse rate monitor application using the ASN filter designer. So over to you, Tobias. 
ASN Filter Designer provides ARM Cortex-M developers with an easy-to-use, powerful signal processing platform for developing real-time dataset cleaning filters and feature extraction filters for Internet of Medical Things applications. Looking at the main UI, we see that the real-time user interface allows you to graphically experiment with your design requirements by just using the mouse meaning that a suitable digital filter can be designed and customized within minutes without explicitly entering any specifications. Let's change the sampling rate to 50 Hz to match our application. Although the filter designer UI is great for designing simple filters, we need a little more control over the parameters for our PPG filter. So let's move over to the live scripting language IDE. The IDE implements a sandbox allowing for the experimentation of any type of filter, the so-called H2 filter. We refer to this scripting language as ASN filter script, as it provides over 82 functions for mathematical operations and filter design. I've already implemented the code for a suitable filter, so let's have a look at the code in depth. The essence of the code centers around designing a low-pass FIR filter using the window method. I've used the Blackman-Harris window here as it gives high sideband attenuation. We then use the frequency rotation transform to convert the low-pass real filter into a complex bandpass filter. The interface variables are just used to set cutoff frequency, filter order and center frequency of the bandpass filter, which we'll experiment with. Running the code, we see the filter is designed based on the interface variable's default values. Locking the axes and then zooming into our region of interest. As we're interested in eliminating the lower frequencies less than 0.5 Hz, we can use the ruler to set the target point for our 3 dB cutoff. We can tweak our interface variables and see the results in real time. Zooming into the 0 Hz region, we can fine tune our null to give us the maximum attenuation at 0 Hz, which will remove our DC offset. OK, this now looks good enough for our evaluation. So let's load a PPG comma separated dataset file into the tool and see the results. Opening the signal analyzer, we first need to set the output math function to angle, such that the zero crossings method works on phase. Also, let's set the frame size to 500 samples, corresponding to a 10 second observation window. We now need to set up the data analysis method for determining zero crossings. Selecting the real output and the zero crossings method, we just need to specify a detection threshold. Plus or minus two should be fine. Finally, let's turn on the frequency estimation algorithm and set the units to biomedical. Also, let's use median filtering instead of mean filtering to minimize the effects of outliers on the zero crossing estimates. And as we're just looking for the end of our sawtooth of our phase waveform, we just need to select down crossings. Taking a comma separated value data file that we obtained via the SDS framework from prototype hardware or another framework such as an EVM, we can simply drag and drop the comma separated file onto the canvas. The tool will then check the file for errors and eliminate the data and finally open the signal generator UI. Clicking on the play button, the data file will be streamed through our complex filter. Adjusting the chart for DC offsets can be achieved like so. This looks good. However, notice that the input and output data are misaligned. This is due to the group delay or latency of the filter. Returning to the main UI, we see that the group delay is constant and equal to 125 samples. Adjusting the signal analyzer display by this group delay, we see that the input and output now line up. Let's leave this filter to run on the dataset and observe the pulse rate estimates, which should be around 90 BPM. 
Very good. Now let's move to a motion artifact and see what the median filter does. As seen, it's quite minimal on the overall estimate, which is great. We can now deploy this filter to an ARM Cortex-M processor via the ANSI-C framework. Let's choose single precision quantization, as an M4F device supports single precision hardware floating point, and in many cases, double precision is a little over the top. ASN's ANSI-C framework was developed with close collaboration with ARM's architecture team, which means that our implementation on all ARM Cortex-M devices is extremely efficient. Our framework takes the CMSYS DSP library implementation a few steps further by fully supporting complex filters in the ASN internal filter cascade and math functions. Although data analysis options such as zero crossings detection and frequency tracking are not part of the framework, as they're application specific. The default ANSI C project is based on the open source Codeblocks IDE, allowing developers even on a shoestring budget to get their applications up and running without any hassles. This code, of course, can be used in Microvision or STM32Cube or even any other IDE supporting C99. Opening up code blocks, we see that the tool has generated a streaming application using a sine wave as an input. Data is handled in blocks, which is in line with the ping pong buffering concept. Notice that the code generators also support Python, MATLAB, and c -sharp, so you can export your design to other environments using our frameworks very easily. It really is as easy as it looks. This now concludes my presentation, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Amazing, Sanjeev. Do you have any final words before we go into questions? Well, I think uh, I've overloaded everybody with information. Uh, but, uh, I hope that the information that was presented that's based upon um, you know, very practical um, applications that we've been helping clients on for a number of years now, I hope that uh, that's certainly helpful for a lot of you. Um, and, yeah, I mean, please, please get in touch with us if we can help you there. Um, as we have a lot of experience here, but we're always learning. Uh, perhaps uh, you have, uh, you know, other experiences and uh, you say, oh, this works really well. Yeah, we'd love to hear from you. Awesome. Awesome. And how? Do, and before we do get to, to, to questions, how do people get in touch with you? Yeah, I mean, you, you can you can get in touch with me uh, on LinkedIn. Uh, you can also send us an email via the website. Uh, there are various contact forms, but uh, yeah, I mean, just contact me on LinkedIn. Uh, uh, you have the profile. Can have a chat. Brilliant. Thank you. Well, let's jump into to Q and A. I've got some questions, audience. If you've got any questions, as I mentioned at the start of this uh, tech talk. Just use the uh, Q&A box, which is on the event page, and there should be a, qu a little Q&A box that says, ask your questions here. Um, so I've got a couple, right? What's great is to see, as you mentioned, is the breadth of ARM Cortex-M cores that you've been, uh, that are able to be used. I understand you've been using ARM for uh, for quite some time, I, I understand. And also you're a, a developer ambassador. Do you mind talking a bit about I mean, um, but, both of those? Sure. sure. Yeah, sure. I mean, basically, uh, we we started off uh, a lot of fire embedded development using microchip many, many years ago. And it was a case of we heard about ARM, but then we thought, hmm. But it wasn't until we basically looked at the ecosystem and we got in touch and then we were like, oh, you know, there are so many cool processes here. Um, and the ecosystem is so broad and so friendly as well um that we thought right you know this that we need to start developing on and that was our journey uh several years ago uh now and then uh you know we've got in touch with various experts at arm who have helped us with the development of our frameworks and uh you know i'm hoping that this uh collaboration will just get better and better over the years 
Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. And you're, and what's great is you're a developer ambassador as well, right? Part of the on developer program, how, you know, uh, we've, um, would love to talk. I know it's on your LinkedIn profile as well, which is always great to see. So that immediately identifies who you are. If you're looking Ooh. for Sanjeev, uh, it's right there and there. So do you mind just briefly talking about that before we get to the next question? Sure. I mean, yeah, I mean, uh, it's a case of, we are very much aimed at stories as well, use cases. So, from all of the people that we've helped over the years, um, we believe very much in let's just tell their story on how we help them. Yep. And also algorithms is something that people kind of think, hmm, you know, uh, it, it, it's all AI. And that's not, that's, that's something that a lot of you looked at. There are a lot of these edge algorithms uh, that don't require AI, um, that just require a little bit more thought of science and mathematics and you can actually achieve very, very, uh, you know, big things and very powerful performance um, using these these techniques. So, as an ambassador, um, you know, I, I write articles from time to time, publish them on LinkedIn on the website, and, and they're very much uh, developers such as yourself with solutions and saying, um, you know, you can do the following with these um, types of filters or algorithms. Awesome, thank you. No, it's really great to have you as a, an ARM ambassador. If you're interested more in the ARM developer program, just head to arm.com. You can just uh, search in Google. You'd absolutely find out more about it if you're interested in becoming part of that. So do check that out as well. Um, and I'd love to get you, you kind of touched on it already, but if you've got any other words, uh, kind of thoughts on this is why are ARM processors so well suited for these kind of applications, right? And the breadth of ARM processors that you've specified and, and and also maybe what gets you excited about helium technology as well the new helium technology we've launched yeah i mean it, it's it's i i think it started back off in the old days if you wanted to do dsp you'd have to buy a dedicated dsp processor from ti or analog devices uh if you did stuff with microcontrollers it was always considered and mm, you know it, it's a step too far so when the m4 came out uh, so, wow it's got hardware floating point supports um so there were loads of things that we could do straight away that made us really really excited and i think now with the migration to helium such that you can do stuff with ai um all in a microcontroller it's not a like a dedicated dsp uh, all very low power there is great support from the uh, ecosystem and the, the the possibilities are just endless with this type of technology. This is something that we're really excited about. And, uh, you know, we certainly see um, in the years to come that we'll be rolling out more designs uh, based around helium. Um, and, you know, they're more enhanced. Uh, well, M4 is an, an older processor, but it, it's something we see everywhere. Uh, yeah. all modern biomedical devices um, use an M4F. Yeah, no, that's, it's great, you know, we, as you say, that that brought that breadth of RMIP, not just stuff that's been released recently that's just being released into silicon and devices, but that's already out there. Um, it, it, and the ecosystem we have really does help that. So do go and check out the resources that, that Sandy mentioned. Do get in contact with them about if you're interested in finding out more about this. We've had a question come in um, talking about kind of devices out there in the market. A uh, question in from Reza, who said, has motion artifact correction been implemented successfully for PPG? I mean, on any devices out there in the market today? Yeah, that's an excellent question, Reza. <laughs> so it, it's hit and miss. There are loads of people who say we correction. Um, and there are there are some ingenious methods, uh, but as far as we know, um, it, it's a case of there have been these little tricks, as I was saying, with signal quality index and just just making some assumptions uh, in order to basically reduce motion artifacts, especially in the smartwatch arena. Uh, if you remember the the solution I was presenting for health patches. Uh, there is a solution there, um, and it, it comes down to yeah, uh, what is your application? But for the 
for the smartwatch market and uh you know please uh tell me if you know of anybody um it's still a very very hot topic whereby people are working uh you know very extensively on this but as far as i know uh i i don't know if a robust motion artifacts uh correction algorithm that is commercially available we're still working on one <laughs> <laughs> gotcha gotcha and let's talk about the future right you know it's you know this is great to see today and it's great to see what's available today but i'd love to get your thoughts on where do you see this technology going where do you see this technology developing into you know and and how will arm be at the center of it yeah i mean i i think everything's going towards wearables so it, it's going to be a case of uh implementing or, or putting i don't know if you can call it that cyborg type you start grafting these sensors onto the skin itself um such that um you can actually power the thing from the heat of your skin uh, so you don't need to have an external wow. battery uh, and you can actually minimize the effects of motion artifacts as it's actually embedded in the the dermis itself um so all of these things um you know are coming and i i do know of various uh companies that are working on that so yeah more more integration into your body uh that's something i i really see coming an arm with the processor technology will be central to that awesome that's so, uh, really uh, exciting to see where this goes who knows i'm looking forward to seeing that at you know as i say it was ces a couple of weeks ago 2025 26 and beyond who knows where that's uh, that's going to come out so you know let's uh, you know it's great to, to hear your thoughts on that so before we wrap up sanjeev any final thoughts today for the uh, the audience attending today's on tech talk and thank you again um but any final words uh, you have before we wrap up yeah well i mean as i said to to uh to, to you guys i mean it, there's a hell of a lot of information that i presented um and i would say you know please go away have a think about it and, and come back if you if you got uh, ideas suggestions or you say you know well, what about this what about that then we'd love to hear from you uh you know please come back to us we don't have all the answers uh this was aimed at just pretty much telling you what our experience has been and worked well um so that that's basically uh my advice uh and my feedback there no oh, awesome do, do get in touch and um and thank you for being you know an arm ambassador thank you for promoting arm technology out there and thank you again for a great arm tech talk you know i've certainly learned a lot about this because this is not an area i know much about um but this has been really really exciting to see so Thank you so much, Sanji. Really, really appreciate your time today. And thank you, audience, for your great questions and your participation. Join us this time next week, 4 p.m. UK, 8 a.m. Pacific, for another Arm Tech Talk. Mm -hmm. uh, just head to arm.com slash tech talks oh, to find out more about that. Uh, I've just put the link there so in the banner so you can see. We're going to be hearing from Newton AI yeah. about how they're using tiny okay. ML technology in, in assistive technology. So this is very exciting. Mm -hmm. And um, Sanjeev, thank you so much again. Audience, thank you so much for your great questions. We'll see you same time next week. Yeah, thanks for having me. And uh, yeah, thank you. Bye-bye.